This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 741, recorded on Wednesday, October 2nd, 2019, Detecting Signals. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight I would love to tell you that we're going to fill your heads with humans, apes, and tardigrades. But first, Twist is supported by listeners like you. We thank you for your support. We really couldn't do it without you. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. All over the world, people worry. What are they worrying about today? Well, that all depends on which person is doing the worrying, where they are in the world, in their life, in their day. Many worries may seem distinct, as if an individual person's specific worry might make them the only human being worrying about such things, but it is rarely true. There are enough people in the world worrying about things that despite how it seems, no one worrier is ever alone in what worries them, though there may be only one person on the planet who's currently worried about being impeached. The number of people worrying about global warming is rising to such numbers that there is coming next a global recognition that none of us are alone in this fight. There is a strength in numbers that can carry, uh, that can cast worry aside and replace it with action. And action is the enemy of worry. But action alone is not enough. What the world needs is action and This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science you, to you too, Justin Blair. And everyone out there, welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again. Woohoo! And we have Blair on the line from the tundra with a special hello. guest. So more on Yeah, hello. More on that in a minute. Tonight on the show, uh, we've got news about, well, we're going to talk about some polar bears, I believe. I've got some meat for you and some asteroids and maybe some baby mussels. Baby nice. mussels are good. Yeah. Justin, what do you have? I've got uh, Joe Schmo versus the volcano, uh, <laughs> the secret life of tardigrades, skin shedding bacteria, and... Seagrass. And seagrass. And Blair, what do you have for us? Where are you? What is going oh, on? Goodness. Uh, we are in the subarctic, uh, just outside of Churchill now, in the tundra. Nice. In the tundra. That's and, great. And we're you're broadcasting in, live you're, from a tundra buggy. A tundra is, buggy. That's what we're doing. Yeah, I would describe it like a huge white school bus, but on like monster truck tires. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I, I always consider them uh, to be uh, if if uh, what it would look like if tardigrades roamed the earth. <laughs> but they do. <laughs> well, I mean, and a larger like in a megafauna. Okay. So. Sure. <laughs> if tardigrades were megafauna, yeah. they would have. They'd look like arctic bunnies. With school bus tires. Okie dokie. Everyone, if you have not yet subscribed to the Twist podcast, why haven't you? You can find us all places podcasts are found. Look for This Week in Science. You can also find us on YouTube and on Facebook. Or you can just visit twist, T-W-I-S dot O-R-G. You can find out all sorts of information about the show, show notes, and about our 2020 Twist Blair's Animal Corner calendar. Wow. Yeah, that's available for pre-order right now. All right, but now it's time for us to jump into the show and talk. And because these ladies in the subarctic um, have a curfew, they're they're sh <laughs> they're sharing a bus van with a lot of people or a train. I'm really confused about the setup. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I would, Blair, could you please introduce our guest this evening? Absolutely. So I am joined by Marisa Krauss from Polar Bears International. Hi, everyone. Hello, Marisa. Um, and, and so uh, we'll share out on social media and stuff like that. You can see us in the Tundra Buggy um, here. But we are here doing this crazy thing. So we're going to try to put words to it to kind of explain our experience. Um, so we are here as part of the Climate Alliance. Do you want to explain kind of what the history of that is? And Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, I work for Polar Bears International, and we're the world's only polar bear conservation organization working for uh, wild polar bears. And we know that zoos and aquariums play a really important role. And so we have a special program that we tailor just to Arctic ambassador centers. And that's a network of zoos and aquariums consisting of about works across the U.S., Canada, and Europe. Um, and, and through that program, we work with educators. We work with animal care staff. We work with PR and social media staff. And one of the primary goals being uh, teaching institutions and staff how to effectively communicate about climate change and solutions that scale the problem. Right, and so I'm here not only because the San Francisco Goo whoa, the San Francisco Zoo and Gardens, um, my home institution is an Arctic Ambassador Center, but also because I'm here to help facilitate some NOKI programming. So um, loyal listeners will re recognize that name. That's the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation. And we use social science to figure out the best way to have hopeful solutions focused conversations about climate change. So based on what Marisa just said and what I just said, you see a lot of overlap there. And so these two organizations have really um, found a way to work together to combine what was a leadership camp for NOKI to kind of find leaders in climate change communication across the U.S. and this uh, climate alliance program where we're trying to find leaders in polar bear conservation uh, conversation. And so it's all kind of overlapping in one. And so um, I got the amazing honor to be able to come out and help with some of those activities. Um, so right now, we've already had this super packed week. Uh, we went dog sledding yesterday. We got to hear from a local trapper about um, kind of what life in the subarctic is like for all types of people. Um, and then we also got to go out looking for polar bears and we were very lucky and we saw one the first day wow. <laughs> five minutes from the airport and we <laughs> saw this polar bear as we were driving away from the airport just kind of bound over some rocks and jump right into the waves of hudson bay absolutely yeah and while we haven't we haven't seen a polar bear today we've been able to encounter a lot of the other things that make this area of the world so unique and special we saw a pod of beluga whales mm -hmm. uh, we saw the aurora borealis last <gasps> i'm ago. so and jealous oh and just a few minutes ago we had an arctic hare right outside our tundra buggy yeah and um, my personal highlight so far has been the ptarmigans which i didn't know existed but they're like these arctic chickens <laughs> and they are amazing. They're kind of snub nosed. They look a little bit like mm -hmm. a grouse. And um, I'm. Uh, they have like bloomers. They have feathers on their legs. They're just amazing. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Birds with bloomers. Yeah. <laughs> Makes them fantastic. Oh, that's wonderful. So, how much longer are you are you traveling around, and what other activities are planned? Yeah. Well, we'll be here. So. So our journey, you know, starts in the gateway of the north. We started on Sunday in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and then we traveled north to Churchill, Manitoba, uh, which you can only access via plane and rail. And we spent two days experiencing the town of Churchill and what makes that community so special. And then uh, we're going to spend the next two days out on the tundra in Frontiers North Adventures Tundra Buggy Lodge. And we'll be roving around looking for bears for the next two days. And then Friday we head south. Yeah. And meanwhile, we'll be using the downtime to talk about climate change communication and how we can work together. Um, I think it's really, it's an amazing opportunity to talk to people from all over North America and figure out how 
we actually have a lot of things in common and we have a lot of common goals and how we can work together and share what we have with each other to help with that. Absolutely. We had we had classroom time for the past two days. And then we mix that in with some informal interpretation from our guides from Parks Canada and Manitoba Department of Sustainable Development. Um, and then we also spend time, which I think is equally important, just building relationships, you know, and building that yeah. community and that sense of trust that we really need to move forward as science communicators. In terms of communicating, I'd love to have you communicate to our audience what you're seeing in the subarctic right now. I mean, this year it's it's been really warm, and um, I'd love to know how that affects the environment that you're in right now, and also the the polar bears and how how it may affect your polar bear sighting expeditions. Absolutely. Well, you know, as we we did see a polar bear previously. I can't mm-hmm. speak to the trend, um, you know, as we see less sea ice. And so this, this population of polar bears lives in what we call the seasonal sea ice eco region. So that's a region of the subarctic where the sea ice forms in the fall um, and then retreats in the spring. And what we're seeing over a period of time is that that sea ice is available six weeks on average, less time that they have to hunt. Mm-hmm. So as, as polar bears have less time to hunt, they have less access to sea ice, less time to hunt those seals that they really need to build that body condition to reproduce and maintain a healthy population. Yeah, yeah because it's the, the, the seals are, they have to cross across the frozen ice uh, that forms over the sea there, right? To, to get out to where the seals are. Absolutely. So polar bears are dependent on sea ice to catch seals. You know, polar bears are great swimmers but they're not as fast as seals, right? So they need right. that surface of the frozen ocean as a platform to, to hunt seals, as do many species across the circumpolar north that depend on Arctic sea ice, like ring seal um, and beluga whales that we saw here in the Hudson Bay as well. That's amazing. All right, well, I don't wanna keep you too, too much longer, but is there anything else that either of you, both of you would like to add about the trip, about uh, Polar Bears International, about anything that you're, that you're doing right now? Yeah, well, I can say that I'd just like to thank Blair here. We're thrilled to be able to work with Blair. We just started working with the San Francisco Zoo uh, about a year hey. ago as an Arctic Ambassador Center. We're thrilled to be working with her with the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation. You know, we're about building relationships and strengthening partnerships to achieve stronger conservation goals. And I believe that we can only do that if we work together. So thanks, Blair. Yeah. And thanks to all of you for for letting us share our story. Um, And I would say um, go to polarbearsinternational.org, right? And um, you can find all of the 48 Arctic Ambassador Centers listed there. And if you live near one, go. Um, go to that zoo or aquarium, talk to the polar bear keepers, talk to the interpreters there. Um, they can communicate what we've been doing here, what's going on in the Arctic as well. And they can give you tools for what you can do at home as a community to help with um, Arctic ecosystems and ecosystems at home who are impacted by climate change. Yeah, your home ecosystem may not be ideal for polar bears, but you can do things that can help the polar bears potentially. Yeah, everybody's yeah. affected. Everybody's affected. And the Arctic ecosystem. So we can all benefit from a reduction in the burning of fossil fuels. And the best way to do that is to come together as a community. So um, the your Arctic ambassador centers are a great way to start that conversation. Or if you don't have one nearby, just your local zoo aquarium science center um, or follow me on Twitter or follow any of those organizations on Twitter as well. Cool. What's your Twitter handle? Uh, we're at Polar Bears. Got in there early. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and if you're That's a good one. In, I'd like to add one more, if I may, if you, yeah. if you don't want, you know, if I can. So um, if you're interested in hearing more uh, from our polar bear scientists and our team live on the Tundra, we have a Tundra Connections program in which we have a mobile broadcast studio about, aboard a Tundra buggy. Um, and we have live cams broadcasting polar bears into classrooms around the world. And you can see that schedule on our website and tune in and follow us live. Follow the polar bears. I love it. 
from the tardigrade buddy, buggy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never think of them the same again. Yeah, I think we're going to tell everyone about that tomorrow. I think they're all going to look at us cocked up. Cocked up. <laughs> you're, in, you're in the belly of a tardigrade. Yeah. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for making the effort to join us tonight. It is really special to hear from you from, you know, your adventurous place uh, that so few people really have been and to to share your experiences and to share them. So Blair, thank you for making this happen. Marissa, thank you for joining us, for working with Blair to, to come on the show tonight. So absolutely appreciated. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope that we can get uh, either you or someone from Polar Bears International back on Twist again sometime in the future. It would be great to hear more about the Polar Bears. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Have a great show, yeah. guys. I'll see you next week. Yeah. Bye -bye. Have a wonderful remainder of your trip. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Guys. Have a good night. Good night. And that was Blair Bazdarich coming to us. Coming to us live to, uh, from the subarctic. Yeah, the North Pole. Not quite the, the South North, North Pole. The South North Pole. Is that what yeah. it's called? She had, a, she had a picture that she sent earlier uh, to her social media channels. There's no snow anywhere. It just there's <sighs> just looks like brown tundra. But there's no snow. I'm like, why is there no snow? There should be no there should be snow. But no, it, this is after summer. It's all yeah. melted. Everything melted. It's all melted. Uh, but we can jump now into some fun science news. This is This Week in Science. Mm. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Yeah. Let's okay, I'm ready. Stories. Well, I'm going to throw some fun at you mm. first. Okay. I love to bring announcement of scientific prizes to the show. And as the Nobels are going to be awarded within the next week, yeah. mm. I only thought it appropriate that we needed to bring up the Ig Nobels. Oh, it's an Ig Nobel time. This is like my one of my favorite uh, times of the year. It is. The Ig Nobels were awarded a couple of weeks ago, September 12th, 2019 at the at Harvard's Sanders Theater. And let me tell you the winners. All right. Bye. Uh, the Medicine Prize goes to Italy, the Netherlands. Silvano Gallus for collecting evidence that pizza might protect against illness and death if the pizza is made and eaten in Italy. <laughs> there are a series of articles entitled, Does Pizza Protect Against Cancer? Pizza mm -hmm. and Risk of Acute Myocardial Infarction, Pizza Consumption, and the Risk of Breast, Ovarian, and Prostate Cancer. Congratulations, Silvano. So, but it only works on people with a certain genetic pool. Is this right? <laughs> it doesn't Where? say that. It just says the pizza has to be made and eaten in Italy. Yeah, yeah I know that's what they say. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Egg. Egg. Definitely an egg. The Medical Education Prize goes to Karen Pryor and Ter Teresa McKeon. For, te for using a simple animal training technique called clicker training, Blair would be familiar with this, to train surgeons how to perform orthopedic surgery. Wait, what? <laughs> click, 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 click. They used clicker training to teach surgeons where and how to, how to cut, I guess. The article's called, Is Teaching Simple Surgical Skills Using an Operant Learning Program More Effective Than Teaching by Demonstration? Well, I don't know if it's more effective, but I guess it worked. Biology Prize goes to Ling Jun Kong, Herbert Kripaz, Agnieszka Goreshka, Alexandra Urbanek, Rainier Dunk, and Tomasz Pantarek for discovering that dead magnetized cockroaches behave differently than living magnetized cockroaches. <laughs> 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 Egg. Egg. I, mean, I don't know that you needed to magnetize them. No, to have this. They were studying in vivo biomagnetic character. They were the study is in vivo biomagnetic characterization of the American cockroach. So I guess they had to see how okay. the magnety magnety magnets worked when they were alive so versus dead. dead. Uh, the circuitry is. Uh, not connecting inside. I don't. I'm actually kind of interested in this bizarre study. You could, you could 
You can find it. It's published in Scientific Reports. This is a, so it was a decent study. Yeah. Anatomy Prize goes to Roger Musset and Buras Bengdouf Bengoudifa for measuring. Oh, you that perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, this one's good. For measuring scrotal temperature asymmetry in naked and clothed postmen in France. Wait. <laughs> You're going to have to say that again. I got that it's. Temperature of scrotums of French postmen? Asymmetry. So the difference Asymmetry. in the temperature between the two sides in whether you're naked or clothed, but only for okay. post, postmen. postmen, people who deliver the post. Well, they do in a lot France. of walking. I suppose there yeah. may be a temperature differential. Yeah, the paper's entitled Thermal Asymmetry of the Human Scrotum. Big. Zig. The chemistry prize goes to Japan for estimating the total saliva volume produced per day by a typical five-year-old child. Okay, that, <laughs> can that, that cannot be helpful. It may be somewhere. It's There's helpful. Something. It's, it's, so it's, helpful. A, it's more data. It's more How data. do you get five-year-old to do anything consistently, even spit as much as they can? Like, I, don't I don't know. know, but you'd have to ask the adult sons who attended the ceremony with the researcher who were some of the stu- subjects of the study when they were children 35 years ago. <laughs> you could ask them. They may remember. Engineering goes to Iman Farabakash for inventing a diaper changing machine for use on human infants. I, what, repeat this. A, I, diaper, I don't know what... a diaper changing machine uh-huh. for use on human infants. Oh, no, 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 stop. <laughs> stop. <laughs> Robots will not change baby diapers. This is not going to be. No. Well, he made one. Okay, uh, the economics prize goes to uh, researchers from Turkey, the Netherlands, and Germany for testing which country's paper money is best at transmitting dangerous bacteria. So that's interesting. Which interesting. who's got the most? Uh, Porous, I guess, or supportive? Yeah. <laughs> whose money has the most bacterially supportive? Yeah, what what which? which what money is the best medium for bacterial growth? It is, yeah. yeah. Which one's the best? Mm-hmm. Does, the does, piece, does it say who the winner is? Who the winner was for that one? I want to know. See these these Ig Nobel Prize, like they uh, they're like really like it, that's really interesting. It is. is there a country that should be washing their hands more than any other? <laughs> <laughs> We'd have to we have to read the paper to figure it out. Uh, The Peace Prize goes to UK, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, and the USA for trying to measure the pleasurability of scratching an itch. How good does it really feel to Uh, scratch an itch? It's it's okay, but it's nowhere near Q-tipping an ear. It, I think people would I, argue the point with I, you. I would, I would go with the, that right out of the <laughs> the shower Q-tip of the ear. Far superior pleasure. Far superior. Uh, the psychology prize goes to Fritz Strack for discovering that holding a pen in one's mouth makes one smile, which makes one happier, and then for discovering that it does not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, Fritz. I, I, I really, I like you. Uh huh. So I proved this, and then I went back, and it's not true. It's not true. Yeah. <laughs> that's not it. That's great science. It you is would actually your own result, and be like, yeah, looked like I had a good result, and yeah. it was, it was bad. It's what's interesting. So it was 1988 when the pen in the mouth to smile study happened. 2017, the article is called From Data to Truth in Psychological Science, a Personal Perspective. Oh, the journey must have been a thing. And I I, I assumed it was over a course of like months. Like we did it once. Let's do it again. Oh, got the opposite result. No, this was a lifetime workpiece that he he was Mm -hmm. like, I never liked Study. I got to do it again. So I'll get it right. Yep. And finally, the physics prize goes to the wonderful researchers who discovered how and why wombats create Q 
cube-shaped poo. Oh, didn't we talk about this? Blair already knows the answer. Yeah, Blair Blair reported on this story. story. We covered the story. Blair reported on it. And yeah, we were all very impressed and intrigued by the cube shaping. And obviously the researchers were as well. And now they've won an Ig Nobel for their work. So congratulations (laughs) to all the researchers. And if you're wondering what I'm going on about these Ig Nobel awards for... It's the fun of science. It's able to look at results that maybe researchers didn't think they were going to get or questions that you never really thought, hey, can we do science like that? Yes, science is a process and you can approach so many things with that scientific process. And you can approach things with fun in your heart and a scientific process or a serious angle really looking to change the world. Sometimes you figure out how cube-shaped poo is made other times i don't know yeah. and and the, the other thing to keep in mind is that you never know uh well sometimes these stories sound a little bit on the frivolous side mm-hmm. and often they are but by the time they get this award uh there are there there are uh, scientific studies that when done do not seem that large and import but have ramifications later down yeah. the line Absolutely. That's why every every bit of data is important, except maybe uh, a robot that changes baby diapers. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I guess if you apply it to adults, that might be handy one day. <laughs> might be handy. Uh, uh, speaking uh, of speaking of like looking at data continually, bringing new results, doing the scientific process. Five systematic reviews were published Monday in the journal Annals of Internal Medicine. The results of these systematic reviews fly in the face of the established nutritional wisdom to reduce the amount of meat in your diet. In fact, the studies find, for the most part, that the health impacts of reducing meat in your diet are slim to none. And they, uh, they've done multiple studies. These systematic reviews used a uh, method that has been uh, started, start, started being developed around the year 2000 by health professionals, is now used by more than 100 organizations worldwide, including the World Health Organization, to, uh, to determine really what kind of health advice should be handed out. The uh, This design, the study design is called the GRADE system, Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. And the way that the system works is that it pushes reviewers, according to a Vox article, to base their conclusions only on the most certain evidence available. And according to this tool, in the case of meat consumption and health, Uh, That was cohort studies and randomized control trials. So this is human studies. They got rid of all the animal studies because they said sometimes these animal studies, the results don't pan out in people. It doesn't apply. So something, a result that happened in animals isn't necessarily going to happen in in people. If meat causes cancer in a rat, it's not necessarily going to cause cancer in an adult. They got rid of observational trials uh, and used these uh, in, 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 and in, the, uh, in, in a lot of the studies that have been done to date, the way that they're managed is you find somebody who has cancer already, ask them about their diet, and then you find a matched control. So you find somebody who matches on all sorts of other lifestyle factors, um, demographic factors, and you match the individuals except for that control does not have cancer. And you ask them about their diet and you go, oh, OK, well, this person didn't eat meat, didn't get cancer. This person ate meat, got cancer. And so you're basing it all on the recollection of the subjects in the studies. And they got rid of all those trials too. They said those studies aren't the best. And they only kept the studies that were randomized controls and were cohort studies in which they followed a group of individuals over many, many years. And so it was more about people continually reporting their nutritional intake and other factors, and then, oh, this person got cancer, and it's recorded in this just study of a large group of people. It's part of a large data set. Um, And it seems like a really 
well-thought-out methodology. However, the American Heart Association, the American Cancer Association, um, multiple organizations are debating the results and saying they've actually... uh, They've actually already submitted a request to the FTC to have the results of the study, um, like, basically banned (laughs) for the FTC to say, this isn't right. The study's not right. uh, Because it flies, like I said, it's controversial. It says the opposite of what all these organizations have been saying to date. So there's there's a whole bunch of uh, details, uh, right, that need to be involved in a, in a study like this. And I, and, and it doesn't sound like even in the, the version they narrowed it down to, did they necessarily get the, the crux of it. So in terms of a cancer meat association, one thing you could, you could talk about is how is the meat that you're eating prepared? If you're a talking about being an avid backyard barbecue where you've got charcoals and you, cook everything until there's a black crisp layer on the outside of the meat. Yeah, it might not be the meat that's uh, potentially causing a stomach cancer. But it could be all this this heavy carbon that you're you're digesting with your food. Also, are you talking about meat that's uh, like in a hamburger that might be rather lean? Or are you talking about something that might be uh, a, a fattier meat when it comes to heart disease? Uh, then you have to ask, uh, what is your microbiome? How well are you digesting this food? What does your body really need this? And if you're a meat eater, what are you talking about? Are you talking about a hamburger a week? Or are you talking about uh, sausage in the morning, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, chicken at lunch, and a steak for dinner every day? So whenever there's human reporting involved, you're going to wind up with a lot of interpretation uh, in terms of what people are think the questions, how they interpret the questions sort of thing. So I get why these uh, organizations are wary of the result. Uh, but it's, it's been this road with nutrition where we there is not a one-size-fits-all. There are things that one person can eat to excess that the person, uh, their neighbor, if they had that same diet, would kill them uh, rather quickly. People uh, sort of Food's different, beautiful. Uh, so this is uh, this is the, my, the next story I got uh, lined up here. Stop blaming volcanoes for global warming, scientists say. Uh, which you know this was this was a trope on the climate change denial or the anthropogenic climate change denial side for a long time. That ah, it's earthquake. It's not. It's uh, it's volcanoes that are causing. Uh, global warming. They're the ones putting out most of the carbon. Well, Deep Carbon Observatory Program's 500 mem- member Reservoirs and Fluxes team has outlined several key findings in an investigation of the present day back billions of years past uh, from Earth's core up to the atmosphere and from uh, the size of a single volcano to the mass of, of all of them across five continents. Among the many wide ranging findings outlined and summarized in the series of papers published in the journal Elements, it says just two tenths of 1% of the Earth's total carbon is above surface in the oceans on land and in the atmosphere. The rest is subsurface, that's crust mantle core. So yeah, there's a lot of carbon down there. Uh, CO2 outgassed to the atmosphere and oceans today from volcanoes and other magmatically active regions is estimated at 280 to 360 million tons per year, Uh, which if you compare that to the output of carbon emissions from humans is about 100 times less than what humans have been doing on a yearly. And, And we have also been increasing. Uh, over time. So it's 40 to 100 times uh, uh, more output from humans, depending on when you're looking, it's about 100 times now. So this is this is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, there was a massive release comparable 
to uh, what what humans, I guess, have done, uh, or to past mass extinctions. The giant meteor impact 66 million years ago that struck uh, what is now Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula rapidly warmed the planet and coincided with the mass extinction of 75%-ish of plants and animals on the planet, including the dinosaurs. So, yeah, humans and giant uh, meteor impact. Bad. Bad. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I love a lot of this study. It came out of um, the 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 carbon. Wow, what's the group that we've um, deep carbon we've, deep carbon observatory? Inst- yes, the deep carbon observatory. Uh, we've spoken with them a few times, and it's just so <laughs> amazing that they're able to track that they've been able to figure out where the carbon is, what the carbon cycle really is on our planet. How much is at the core of our Earth? How much is in the mantle? And how much is in the in the in the atmosphere, which is like teeny, teeny, tiny oh, yeah. percentage yeah. of small. all the carbon on the planet. Tiny. Oh, yeah. But it has such an impact. And our influence is like on the level of previous mass extinctions. Like you said, asteroids, volcanic eruptions that have destroyed, you know, destroyed life on the planet. <laughs> yeah. Yay, people. We're awesome. Go. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I just, I think the whole, the, yeah, the whole concept of understanding how our earth uses up carbon, how it sucks it up into the crust, into the mantle, how it dives deep and where it goes and how it gets outgassed and how that flows is, you know, it's so important to our understanding of how we really are impacting our small percentage of what is there. Yeah. I was actually surprised uh, how little, I mean, that was including the oceans too. Yeah. Uh, Two tenths of 1%. Uh, So it's, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, yeah, big impact and, and small amounts. You're right. That's, That's what we're dealing with. Yeah, it comes down to, I guess, you know, it's what is the 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 percentage, the proportion that is applicable to us and life. You know, we need to we need to pay attention to that and what we're what we're working on. Stop blaming the volcanoes. Oh, yeah. Hey, do you want to have a Blair's Animal Corner without Blair? Yeah, let's do it. (laughs) <laughs> Should we play her music yeah. without her? Okay, mm-hmm. here we go. Let's dance. She loves our creature, great and small. By pet, mill, a pet, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a With Justin and Kiki. Hey, hey, Kiki, what you got? <laughs> Ow, I was going to do that to you and put you on the spot. <laughs> ah, oh, okay, I've got some ape minds for you. The planet of the apes. We love to talk about how smart people are. And one of those aspects of intelligence that we come back to is this thing called theory of mind. And is an ability of humans and very few other animals to be able to determine what other animals are thinking based on your own experience, being able to go, I went through that experience. This other organism, this other animals going through that experience. I can, I can relate. I think this is what they're thinking right now. This is what they're going through. It's realizing that uh, that you can attribute mental states to yourself and others. That others, Which, if you have a mental state, yeah. others have a mental state, mm-hmm. right? Which is handy because if you if you would wander down to the watering hole in primitive lifey fashion, and mm-hmm. something came out of the water and ate something on land, you might it might if you didn't have any form of empathy, you might be like, oh, that was interesting. Uh, might as well go down to the watering hole and get a drink. I mean, you need, mm-hmm. you need these signals and you need to be able to 
uh, put yourself in that position so that you can be better adapted to the environment. Right. And especially with social animals who have to get along with each other Mm -hmm. and you have to figure out, oh, I'd be angry if somebody stole my banana. Somebody stole dude's banana. Okay. He's probably pretty angry, right? So being able to attribute these mental states, emotional states to other conspecifics, others like you, uh, then it, it, it does give that benefit. And so there's this, been this question for a really long time as to whether or not other great apes have theory of mind. And so there's a new study that was just published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS. And it turns out that, hey, based on the results, they do, more or less do. They used chimpanzees, 29 chimpanzees, 14 bonobos, and four orangutans to do this experiment. And in the experiment, the apes were exposed to these boxes. There was a barrier, and it was either able able to see through it, transparent, or it was opaque. And they had to find, pick one of the two boxes. They would see somebody hide something under a box. They would go behind the barrier, and then they would see somebody mess with the boxes, move the little toy to the other box, And then they'd have to go choose the box. If it was transparent, the apes could see this happening. If it was opaque, they could not see it happening. They had to infer it. Yes, they had to infer it. And and so they would watch other apes have to deal with the situation after having gone through it themselves. With either that transparent barrier where they could see the actor move the little toy from box to box. Or with it opaque where they so they would know that the ape could not see this happening and so they were like oh and they they measured where the apes were staring which box the apes stared at the most and they found that the the apes were watching the box that the apes behind the barrier was uh that that they they knew the apes were going to look there even though the toy wasn't there anymore if the apes Mm -hmm. were behind the opaque barrier so they're basically doing this eye tracking experiment as a a test of how do they know what the other ape is going to do yeah they're using some prediction skills here yes and so they found that the apes that had the experience of seeing through the transparent barrier that they stared at that the box where the toy had been much, much longer than apes who had had the opaque barrier and hadn't had the same exper- experience. So there was a difference in their, based on the experience that the apes had had on what they were predicting the apes that were going through it were going to be doing. Right. Theory of mind. Yeah. yeah. It is present even in the apes, of course. Oh, ah, tardigrades. Tardigrades. Oh, yeah. speaking of tardigrades. Uh, these are, everybody not who, who has been listening to the show knows what a tardigrade is. But if you haven't, it's a plump looking microscopic alien bath toy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's an incredible creature. You need to Google it if you haven't seen one. Uh, they're also called water bears, moss piglets. There's, they have some pretty interesting uh, resilience, uh, even extremophiles. They have uh, the ability to, they've survived in the vacuum of space for a mm-hmm. period of time. They, they can basically dehydrate themselves. There's another word for what they're doing, but they basically can become dehydrated and then come back to life again later. Uh, so one of the things that's really interesting about them is they can also survive a pretty decent amount of radiation uh, as well as high radi- so high radiation levels, uh, very cold temperatures, exposure to deadly chemicals, all sorts of places where the th- life should die. And a number of these conditions, even if you are some sort of an extremophile, that has managed to survive in one of these environments, 
the fact that these the tardigrades can survive in many of them is just pretty uh, pretty perplexing. So, what they've uh, previous studies had uh, identified a protein named DSUP, which they called damage suppression protein, which is a protein that is only found in tardigrades this far. So intriguingly, when they uh, tested it in human cells, they found that the protein protected human cells from x-rays, hmm, from damage that would be associated. So it's not known exactly how this DSUP protein was performing this. Uh, so team at UC San Diego uh, ran some tests, some studies. They discovered that this DSUP protein binds to chromatin, which is a form of DNA within the cells. It's basically kind of binds around and creates a protective uh, overcoat. <laughs> Shields <laughs> DNA from hydroxyl radicals, uh, which are produced by x-rays. So uh, the, the scientists don't really think that the there was necessarily a benefit to tardigrades being x-ray uh, resistant, but that this... Uh, that this chromatin wrapping of the protein may be protecting it from all sorts of other normally deteriorating uh, scenarios. So this may be, this may be one of the, one of the secrets of the yeah. tardigrades extreme of file existence. And then they're already you know, speculating that you could utilize this perhaps then uh, in doing things for biotech in which if you wanted to create a hardier, more resistant uh, strain of, of, say, a bacteria or something, you might be able to protect its DNA if you were putting it through a, a rough process. Uh, but then, you, you know, the, the thing I first thought of when, when you said, this is, this is the augmented uh, space human. Right? That's the first thing I thought, too. Yeah. I'm like, well, we're going to space where we should wrap up that DNA. You know, spaceships <laughs> are only so radiation proof. It's it's a tough, it's like one of the tougher things for long distance space travel is dealing with all the radiation or living on on one of the moons of Mars or on Mars itself is this exposure to radiation that you'd be dealing with. Yeah. So the downside... The downside of that is that if you do get cancer in space, then you can't go through uh, radiation treatment. Oh. I mean, would you? I mean, you'd have to do something to open up the DSUP so that your DNA mm -hmm. could be accessed mm -hmm. if you are one of these future space humans. So it comes with a little bit of a downside, but maybe the upside is much more of an upside. You know, you got to do that cost benefit analysis. Hopefully by the, and hopefully by the time, yeah, that's a good point. Hopefully by the time we are uh, infusing uh, future human astronauts with uh, this DSUP protein ability, we've also made them cancer free. Like, right. And may, or if not completely cancer free, then we're not doing this sledgehammer radiation treatment. Yeah. Oh yeah. Better it, right? cancer treatments too. Better and and treatments. also just for economics, even in the future, it's probably best that we have then augmented really super intelligent mice to travel on tinier spaceships <laughs> <laughs> who can do, go out there and do the research. We've done everything uh, for the mice. It's all about the we've mice. We've got them so figured out. We already have cancer-free <laughs> mice strains. We can just uh, go the next step and, and make them our future astronauts. Yeah. Uh, fruit flies and mice, the research animals of choice they are going to go to space be cancer free it's going to be it's going to be amazing i hope that we can use clicker training to train them to do things for us <laughs> all right everyone we have come to the end of the first half of this week in science we'll be back in just a few moments with more this week in science stay tuned Thank you for supporting This Week in Science. We do appreciate you being here with us week after week after week. 
talking about the science, learning about the science. If you really want to keep track of all that science, you know what would be a fantap, fantap, what was I going to say? Fantabulous? Yes, fantastic way to keep track of that is with a 2020 Blair's Animal Corner calendar. And with the 2020 Blair's Animal Corner calendar, you will be able to keep track of episodes of Twists. Yes, it says on each calendar when Twists is going to be airing. That's right. You know it's Wednesdays, but we just like the little reminders. Sometimes we put in there whether or not we're going to be taking a break and whether it's a holiday for us. So you'll know that ahead of time. There are also special science holidays that are noted throughout the year. So you'll be on top of your science celebration game year round. And the most important aspect is all of the art created for the calendar by Blair. If you go to twist.org, you can click on the wonderful Hypnotoad up in the corner of our webpage to pre-order your 2020 Blair's Animal Corner Twist calendar now. That's right. Click on that lovely Hypnotoad. This year, Blair has uh, has done a stained glass-esque art style, and uh, you can... It, the exciting thing about that, you can if you get the newsletter, you probably saw her write up about her methodology and how she came to it this year. Uh, so that's another thing at twist.org. You can apply for our newsletter, sign up when the pop-up window comes up, or just let me know. Send me an email, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Say, hey, put me on your newsletter list, and I will put you on the newsletter list, and you'll get little emails and stories and things that are uh, adjacent to the show, but things that we're thinking about and doing in our lives that are related to This Week in Science. In other news, right now we also have a special offer. That's right. We have a very special offer right now on Patreon. Patreon is our crowdfunding website. And for a limited time until October 14th, you will be able to uh, get a framed piece of Blair's art if you go to Patreon and donate at the $50 per month level and above. So the $50 per month level, if you go and donate there, you'll become eligible for uh, getting a framed piece of art. So there's 12 pieces of stained glass art that will be available this year. And there are some left over from previous calendars from previous years. Anyone who's already at that $50 a month level, you're already eligible. But if you are at $25 a month, $15 a month, and you want to get in there for a short period of time, get a framed piece of art, Sign up at the $50 a month level. If you support us at that level for three months, we'll send you a wonderful framed piece of art. Original by Blair. Not cut out of, not, not memorexed. Did I just say memorexed? I memorexed? Did. Yeah. <laughs> not a copy. <laughs> not photocopy. Not a reproduction. Not a reproduction. Not chopped out of the calendar with a pair of scissors. The original <laughs> art that Blair created for the calendar you'll get that original art uh in a frame and it's just for the next two next two weeks until the 14th and once that's gone that's it so get in there if you want a framed piece of art from blair this is exciting to us because it will help us raise funds for some things that we uh that we need to do as as a group, as a, a podcast, and we would really appreciate your support. Um, you know, not only will you get that piece of art, but you will also uh, get that that warm, fuzzy feeling, the knowledge that you are supporting an independent science podcast who does not get support from any big advertisers or big names. We stay independent so that we can uh, be as unbiased as possible for you. Thank you for supporting This Week in Science. We really could not do any of this without you. And we're back with more This Week in Science. Yeah, and we are back for that 
section of the show, that segment of the show that we love to call This Week in What Has Science Done for Me Lately. Lately. Ooh. How's that cold helping out there? Oh, all right. Here's our letter from this week. Hello, everybody. So, what has science done for me lately? Well, lately being 29 years ago. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. My self preservation skills are poor at best. I'm attracted to caution tape, Halloween of 1990, my senior year of high school. While out with a friend, my car broke down. While waiting for a ride to come pick us up, I decided to climb a high voltage transmission tower. Oh, no. I had always thought, don't touch a wire. What's the worst that can happen? And I found out. Mm. I was 55 feet up the tower, 15 feet below the power lines when the power arced off and hit me. My friend, yeah, my friend Kelly was on the ground and said the sky lit up so bright. It was midnight, by the way, that she couldn't see me. She said I kept screaming, I can't let go, when suddenly darkness and my body fell to the ground. It gets better. When I hit the ground, I started a brush fire. Yep. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. I was an ember. Never met one of those before. The base of the tower was surrounded by a six-foot fence with three strands of barbed wire on the top. Remember that disclaimer, I climbed all of that to accomplish this goal. I was motionless at this point, thought to be dead. Within minutes, the emergency crews were showing up and yelling at me to lay still to avoid further injuries. She had to do this because they weren't allowed to cut the lock on the gate until the power company showed up to determine whether or not it was safe to enter. After about, yeah, after about 45 minutes, the brush fire had extinguished and Kelly was losing her mind that no one was helping me. An onlooker walked around to the back of the fence and pulled it up from the ground, at which point Kelly slid underneath and approached me. This apparently changed the situation and gave cause for the cops to cut the lock and the paramedics entered and retrieved me. Oh, good job, Kelly. Good job, Kelly. (laughs) I was put into a helicopter and off to the hospital while in the chopper. I died, arriving at the hospital with no what? signs of life. This, I thought e- this was going to end better. Oh, well, that's, I'm so sorry. I know. The ER unit grabbed the defibrillator. Anyone see the irony where this is going? They <laughs> yeah, sh- <laughs> <laughs> mm. yeah, see where this is going. I've had um, actually enough voltage for one evening. Thing. Yeah. Anyway, oh. they shocked me back to life. I spent the next seven days in a coma. Both lungs had collapsed and I was on a respirator. Wow. After waking from the coma, I was still in a space between, meaning I was responsive but not aware. Uh, I came around on November 23rd with no recollection of what had happened. To this day, I have no memory of the event or the 20 minutes or so leading up to it. Everything I'm telling you is simply what has been told to me. I was 48% second and third degree burned. My left arm was welded to my side due to a broken collarbone, the only break from a 55-foot fall. They couldn't start physical therapy until it healed four weeks in. That meant my left arm was useless when I awoke. A rep from the power company told me I was hit with roughly 140,000 volts. Coal fired at that. After 10 months of therapy and a few surgeries, I could lift a glass of water to my mouth. Within a year, I had a full recovery and started rock climbing. I went on to get a job as a stunt performer with full use of my arms. Science. Yeah. (laughs) Science made all of this possible. Science figured out a way to make me whole and live on to travel the world doing awesome things with amazing people. When someone tells me they don't trust science, I simply take my shirt off and point out that it wasn't a politician or belief that allowed me to tell my story. It was science. Pure science. I love your show. Blair's theme song stays in my head for days after each episode. Keep doing what you're doing. And thanks for letting me share my story. Take care. Josh Hicks. Josh, that is an incredible story. Um, You are one lucky person. Oh, my goodness. And and I'm going to just say, yeah, you are science and Kelly. And Kelly. (laughs) And Kelly. (laughs) 
Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> although, although, on the other hand, maybe if Kelly had been a little bit more persuasive. Up front? <laughs> you know. Maybe you shouldn't climb up that 55-foot tall There's tower. a reason that it's barbed wire and has the caution. To put, that, uh, that is a fantastic story. And I love, I love the fact that the... Uh, uh, the disregard for caution to some degree, even after, uh, even after. Like, well, you know, in the stunt profession, there's, there's going to be a, at least a little pre-planning for how the, uh, <laughs> the things will go. Uh, fantastic. That's my favorite story. Yeah. Thank you awesome. so much for sharing with us. It yeah. Is, um, yeah, this is people in the chat room are, are, have loved it. They're all saying, what a story it really is. And I mean, it is amazing that you are able to tell it today. Mm -hmm. I would love science to tell me how I can keep my son from doing stunts like that <laughs> when he's older, but I don't know if that's possible. Share, share this story. Share, I'll share this story. That's I'll right. I'll tell story. him this story. Maybe yeah. don't ever do that. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God. This should be, this should actually, you know, forget the sign that says caution. They should just, put little plaques with this story. This story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like oh i didn't know that was That's possible why. Oh, okay yeah. let me see let me see yeah josh thank you so much for enjoying twist thank you for listening thank you for sharing just just amazing and yeah thank you science for making it possible for you to share Everybody, if you have a story you would like to share, if you have a note, if you have a poem, if you have, yeah, some small tidbit, how science has, has, what science has done for you lately or 29 years ago, let me know. Send me an email, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or leave a message on our Facebook page. All right, Justin, let's move back into the science. Tell me about uh, bacteria. Oh, uh, let's see. What is this story? This is, uh, yeah. So we've talked about it a bit on the show, how I think the estimate is 2050, which is not that long from now, 30 ish years. Uh, there could be 10 million deaths per year due to basic infection, uh, because antibiotic resistance, uh, is going to be a real problem. Uh, amongst amongst microbes that have been able to adjust and evolve to the ways that we've been attacking them. We have new and different ways and approaches coming up. However, this research is a little bit alarming because it uh, it is pointing out that bacteria uh, in certain situations can shed their skin. They can actually exist without a cell wall, which is a thing that most human, or human cells don't have this outer cell wall. Uh, and so the way that the body identifies intruders is this weird thing that they have on the outside of their cell, uh, which is this, this shell. And that's where uh, they attack and destroy bacteria. This is what the drugs that we have developed. This is what our antibiotics do is they, they, this, they identify uh, pathogens by this outer shell. Uh, this study was uh, specific to urinary tracts uh, in, in elder folks, but in it they found uh, that there were, by filtering, they kind of was sort of an interesting thing. They had this filter that should have filtered out uh, I believe it's E. coli in this study. This is in mm -hmm. Nature Communications. Look specifically at bacterial species associated with recurrent urinary tract infections. It found many different bacterial species, including E. coli, uh, that can survive as what they are calling L form in the human body. That is having gotten rid of that outer cell wall. So what happens then is it also changes breeding behavior it changes the shape of bacteria it changes a lot of the things that the body might normally use to identify so they are now looking into finding these these uh ways to target uh l form and and it might be more uh 
It might be more pervasive, of course, than they found in this one study. This is something that had come up and been noticed some long, long time ago <clears throat> by researchers, but hasn't really surfaced again in a long time. Uh, this discovery is pretty big in finding that there is another way in which bacteria can exist within the human body that we previously were not aware of. Oh. I'm sure there are probably many ways bacteria exist in our bodies that we're not aware of. We're only aware of ways that that we can grow in a Petri dish. Or, you know, if we can sequence the, sequence the gene then and associate it with some kind of phenotype, then we say, oh, that's what that is. But, yes. yeah, there's probably, yeah, this is cool. Yeah, so I guess it was first discovered in 1935. Uh, by Emmy Kleinberger Nobel, who named them after the Lister Institute, where she was working at the time, which is why they're VL4. Uh, yeah, really wild. It's that's such cool. a funda that's fundamental uh, aspect and descriptor of bacteria uh, that to know that they can survive uh, without it changes a lot. It makes a lot of interesting arguments too. Uh, how many are, how much bacteria is there that we don't know about? How much, yeah, <laughs> making how much estimates. About? Yeah. yeah. And these are, and these are also, they're discovering this in bacteria that normally have. So it's not just, there's a form of bacteria that doesn't have a cell wall. This is showing bacteria that have cell walls normally can also survive in a mode without them, uh, which is then another, sort of evolutionary trait perhaps hmm. or or uh, this then can make arguments about pre-evolutionary traits about like if you don't need microbes if microbes can exist without the cell wall maybe in the first place uh maybe the cell wall is something that comes much later you know it, it, yeah it's at both ends of this it's sort of uh asking questions so interesting study and i can't wait to hear more uh as, as, as research delves into this and I, yeah, I'd love to know more about how, like, really what, it, is it specifically to evade the immune system of the host? Is it to evade other bacteria? What, what is it, what are these organisms specifically evading by right, losing, right. losing this? Yeah, this I mean, this way that, of, I, this method of identification, right? Right, because uh, what is where does the virus target? It finds yeah. some spot on the cell wall, and on then the it does wall. its it, right. Yeah, so this is it could be it, it could uh, it could be one of these sort of things that we've seen in, in other bacteria where you have sort of stochastic activities where they have sort of random different survival uh, traits within a single population where some will turn right. themselves into a seed right. and harden the shell and some will become elongated or some will be, can try to multiply really fast within the same population, trying different strategies. So whatever's attacking them may not be able to be successful against all of these strategies. Right. This might just be one more of these strategies that we hadn't really been uh, keenly aware of. Uh, you won't get us all. Hey kid, go into stealth mode. Yeah. That's not, it's life. It's life finds a way, but I like I like it better. Like you know, life, you won't find us all. It's also you won't like find a, us all. You won't get all. Which, yeah. <laughs> we will evade you. We will hide you. Hide from you. That's cool. Speaking of other detection of other things that we haven't really seen before, researchers last de December discovered an asteroid in the asteroid belt. It is called. 6478 Galt was just an asteroid. It, it had been discovered decades ago, but in December of last year, uh, astronomers were looking at it and they're just doing an average, a regular survey. And they're like, what is going on? That, that, that asteroid is active. It's moving. <laughs> yes, active, moving. And in fact, it has two plumes coming off of it like a comet oh. and it's changing color its surface is changing from reddish to bluish so, so there's a there's a chemical reaction taking place on this asteroid that is propelling it and uh changing its color is this what's happening so the 
my first question was, which isn't really addressed, is how did this asteroid that was observed first in 1988 go from just being a normal asteroid, a normal space rock, doing just rocky things in space, how did it go from being inactive to active? What happened? We don't know that. Um, the second question is what this art, this paper that's just out uh, is, ta- is talking about is their initial observations of the asteroid make it think make them think that the change in color that's occurring is because this asteroid is actually spinning and it's spinning as it's moving through space and that spinning and movement is causing the reddish dust on the surface of the asteroid to blow off and that wow. dust that's coming off is revealing uh, the blue layers underneath, the iron underneath that hasn't oxidized. Uh, and so it's going from this reddish, dusty surface to a cleaner, <laughs> bluer surface. And the dust is what's coming off and creating this plume and creating something of a comet tail. But it's a weird active asteroid tail. Huh. So, yeah, it's not a comet. It's a rock with tails, which is weird in itself. Uh, but the you know the the thing that the astronomers looking at this are excited to talk about is the idea that the asteroid belt we kind of think of it as this place where just a bunch of rubble is floating right it's just sitting there not doing anything but this is evidence that there's a lot more activity going on within the asteroid belt things are moving around shifting and changing all the time uh, and. You know, these movements are the kinds of things that do shift other objects. If you have a big enough object moving, it will its gravitational pull will potentially move something else nearby. Uh, and these objects can get can get moving, bump into each other, maybe even not be knocked out of the asteroid belt. Yeah, it's one come. giant system of butterfly effects, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So they're going to be looking at it a little bit more when it next comes into the sky. They're hoping that they'll be able to measure the asteroid's brightness over time to be able to see the dust tail and determine exactly exactly what is going on with this active asteroid, the Galt asteroid. And then another thing, did you know that there's a second cometary interstellar interloper in our yes. solar system? yes. Yes. So we had Oumuamua a while ago, Umuamua. but now, yeah, now we have 2i Borisov. 2i Borisov does not have as an exciting name as Oumuamua, <laughs> but it, it also is a comet. And the astronomers observing 2i Borisov published in Astrophysical Journal Letters, that they have seen the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, flux of the uh, the light that's coming through the cometary t- material, uh, that they can tell that there is gas coming off of the comet that is cyanogen. And you go, oh, cyanogen, is that special? Is that, what is that? Well, it turns out... Nitrogen? It's, yes, yeah, cyanide. So it is a, a pseudo halogen formed of carbon and nitrogen. Yes, a colorless toxic gas with a pungent odor. Thank you for the warning, toxic <laughs> gas. <laughs> the two cyano groups are bonded to, uh, together at their carbon atoms. You may ask, ooh, is this special gas from another solar system far away? Because this is an object that apparently, because of its trajectory, is not of our solar system. It's from somewhere else. And so by looking at it, we go, is this different? Is it the same? Well, turns out that cyanogen gas is emitted, released from comets in our own solar system. So it suggests that wherever this is from, is similar in makeup to our own system. A homogenous universe. Yeah. Which yeah, kind of exciting. To, to yeah, that's, that's, that's good to know. That's really awesome. It is good to know. Yeah. Now we know. The more we know. 
Well, it is, you're right, though. It is, it is a friendly poisonous gas when it tells you that not to breathe. <laughs> yeah. I'm stinky. Don't breathe okay. me. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> yes. What else do you have, Justin? Oh, that's a great question, and I'm glad you asked. Oh, yeah. This is, uh, this is seagrass meadows. Uh, that are, I think these ones are off the coast of Florida. At least it's University of Florida researchers who are looking at them. And they've, they've made, uh, a pretty interesting discuss, discovery. So seagrass is very much threatened by, uh, coastal developments and by pollution and by climate change. And the question is, is, are these grass meadows under the water really that important? Uh, and they know from the past that this is a, there's a lot of life forms that use them for shelter and the like. Uh, but they don't know, they, what they didn't really know is how, uh, how permanent they are. Is it possible that they can kind of come and go like a meadow will, like it can be filled with seagrass and then it can disappear, it could show up somewhere else. Will it just move further out to sea or you know, take up new spaces? Uh, basically, you know, some of these have been at the most observed for a decade or two. Uh, in this study, though, they were able to use microfossils and the like to sort of date some seagrass beds and found that they could be centuries and millennia old, uh, hundreds and thousands of years old. They also used, they, they also found some pretty interesting stuff. There was a much uh, richer variety of animals uh, in and around the seagrass meadows. There was protection from, for the seafloor. Uh, there was carbon storing. It improved water quality and clarity in the surrounding area. It had this ability to slow wave energy, which then you would be less erosion on the, on the shores. Mm -hmm. uh, they could, actually do uh, and then because of all of these sort of things created a very attractive place for fish birds marine mammals invertebrates algae so giving a uh a, a really important role for seagrass in the ecosystems of coastal regions and there was a 2009 study that they point out that mapped seagrass meadows that have uh, as having decreased by 29% since uh, 1879. So, you know. Uh, is that because, I guess, that, I guess there'd be multiple reasons, sea level yeah. rise, um, but then what else is it? Like uh, development uh, or what, what's happening? It's, it's really all of the above. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, these are, you can think of, uh boats especially once mm -hmm. you know we got into combustion engine boats that were probably leaking oil into the water and nobody really cared for the first right. you know 70 years of doing this uh and very populated areas of course because these are coastal areas that humans like to go out and fish and play in and, and the like uh but we're, we're talking about a, a anchor ecosystem uh, which is a term I made up, but uh, Blair probably has the right uh, version for what I'm trying to say. But they are the house and feed and nurture a lot of the the feeder uh, creatures, snails. So it's kind of there. It's kind of like coral reefs. So you're looking yeah, at yeah. the seagrass is supporting. It's an entire ecosystem, and you lose the seagrass, you lose all of the animals and the diversity that goes along with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, yeah, that's that's that is very interesting. I mean, we look at corals are the huge topic that people are talking about because they're so beautiful. They have all these all these species of corals, and you look at them and you're like, oh, they're amazing. And the fish that are in them are these beautiful, colorful fish, and it, it's such a it's a, a vibrant ecosystem that evokes emotion in people when you see it. And, and seagrass is just grass under the sea. Grass. You can't yeah. see all of that diversity taking place. Yeah. Yep, and it's one exactly. of these things too. If, if, if this, you know, if, if we were to start a save the seagrass campaign, uh, we would be mocked for wanting to save grass that is under the ocean that nobody sees. Mm -hmm. uh, 
See right, grass? Course, I don't see grass. What? <laughs> yeah, and you, you know, but that's this is what happens uh, very quickly yeah. when when people don't understand uh, that it's not who can't see the sea grass for the trees. Is that the, the right? Grass meadow yep. for the blades. Mixing, I mixing some metaphors. But that's all right. Messing up, messing up metaphors. Still plants. But, it's vegetation. Yeah. I got you. But this is one of those things that might sound to some ears as a nonsensical thing. Uh, to try to preserve. Uh, but if you can explain at some point that actually that's what's sustaining your fisheries off the coast of the waters that you inhabit and enjoy, you know, that ends up on your plate or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is why, this is why the, uh, the seals that you like to go out and look at are visiting your little part of the world uh, because there's an ecology that has invited them in. Yeah. So many, yeah, there are many connections to be made. I am shocked at how the story has never really come up before, and we have lost th basically thirty percent of seagrass yeah. <laughs> to date. That I mean, that's it's like hello, that's a significant amount. <laughs> yeah, so this is <laughs> and the, the third. Here we go. Yeah, it's corals. Uh, we're gonna need to put seagrass right up there with the corals when we're talking yeah. about preserving uh, our coastal areas. One thing that does not get preserved, little muscles, apparently, when you're a baby, an embryo. We talk a lot about, oh, when you go through these developmental stages, right? We maybe have gills at one point when oh, the, the, the gill oh, sets, yeah, the, when, you're, when, you're, when you're an embryo, and then that embryonic stage passes, and this, the skin and all everything... Uh, fuses together and those gills go away and you're running through evolutionary it. history uh, yes it's called it's so the, the terminology is ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny oh those are the big that sounds words sexier. yeah yeah ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny which means the stages of development repeat all those evolutionary phases yeah, that so amazing that we've passed through and uh, researchers this last week have reported on a new a new finding of things that are in our embryonic stages between the weeks of about seven to thirteen uh, of gestation that go away that that aren't kept. And they looked at the hands and the feet of little babies, and they did these MRIs scans to look at the, the muscles and they found extra muscles, little tiny muscles. They're called dorsometacarpals and they are these little tiny muscles that go back to uh, our, our reptilian ancestors. What? They go back about 250 million years. Wow. Yeah. So there are the normal muscles that go on to create uh, the movements of the thumb, the hand, and actually there are these extra muscles. The, the thumb has some extra muscles that researchers think allows the dexterity of the thumb that we have compared to some other animals that lose that the fine muscles that are there. Those little fine muscles actually at the embryonic stage exist for more fingers. And there are oh. these two little muscles that disappear during development. They fuse with the other muscles in the hand. Sometimes they just disappear completely. Sometimes they fuse with other muscles um, to create the final anatomical structure of the developed hand. And it's a good thing that they do. Otherwise, it would be all thumbs. Maybe all thumbs, right? Much more, but it's a it's a really interesting finding because this is something that it's called an atavistic trait. This is a trait that exists from a, an ancestral state, but then goes away during development. That it disappears, and so we know that we have like we have the gills, we have the tail, we've got these little muscles in our hands now that we can count on, and during development also. Brain, like neurons, we have tons of neurons that get pruned away. There's all sorts of things that change during development. I just think it's a, a fascinating, development is a fascinating adventure. It's a fascinating yeah. story because it takes us into the future with the individuals, but also into our past. 
Yeah, Which I think that's is pretty really cool. amazing. Yeah. So anyway, new ways of looking at things. You find new things. So they mm-hmm. found this, this cool thing. New muscles that we didn't know were there that are part of our development. Do you have more stories? I have one more. Oh, go for it. All right. So this one, I think, is a a, a really fun story. We talk about um, we talk about prosthetics and the direction of of uh, brain control devices. These BCIs, these brain con- brain computer inter- interfaces, and also just prosthetics that have some amount of uh, dexterity and flexibility. Now, some researchers out of EPFL have developed a new a new model it brings together neuroengineering with robotics to create a robotic hand that can be controlled by neural impulses from the uh, from the stump of an amputation or from the brain, depending on where uh, they would come from. But the idea is that the muscles that remain after amputation can be can be trained and controlled to uh, to to make certain movements. And th- then they use robotic control to uh, take over the movement. So in terms of how the human body works, if you're going to trip and fall or if you're going to drop a cup, that your body needs to react in a very quick mm-hmm. amount of time. And very often, your brain is not even involved in tripping and falling. It is a spinal reflex that will help right you. Many times, the reflexes that go to the spine and back or uh, are are part of what maintain a movement, and so instead Cause, cause your of your brain, your brain in that moment is still active, but it's going, oh no, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> exactly something's gonna fall. <laughs> what am I gonna do? <laughs> exactly. And so what they've done is they've brought together. It's called shared control for prosthetics, so that individuals. It's not not at the point where they can test it on. Uh, not actually put it into use in prosthetics, but they're testing it on people currently. They are training people to use the muscles that remain after amputation to allow them to control a robotic hand to come in contact with an object, say like a water bottle. And then the robotic arm takes over the rest of the way. There are sensors on the robotic arm that respond then to the shape and texture of whatever object it encounters. And so then the robotic arm takes over the actual holding. So the person will think the control of grasping or touching, and then the robotic arm will take it the rest of the way. So it's a combination of of uh, individual control and robotic control, which they're hoping will move things forward in a really positive manner for uh, future prosthetics. It's kind of exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Robots. You like my robot arm? (laughs) Ha ha. I tell it what to do and then it does my bidding. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. I think it's super cool. Super cool. Super, yeah, super cool robots. Hey, have we come to the end of a show? Did we do it? I think so. Did we do this? Mm Mm-hmm. All right. We've done it. I missed Blair, but I'm glad that we got her in in the beginning. I hope she makes it home safely, doesn't get eaten by a polar bear. (laughs) That would be no good. We've come to the end of another show. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We hope you enjoyed all the show, all the science, as much as we did. Thank you also to Fada, who helps with show notes and show descriptions, social media, and with our chat room. Thanks to Gord McLeod for helping with the chat room. Identity4, thank you for recording the show, sometimes twice. And thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you, too. 
Paul Disney, Andrew Swanson, Craig Landon, Andy Grow, Ed Stupolik, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Richard Porter, Mark Massaros, Jack Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill Kay, Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Eric Knapp, Richard Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, da- Donald Mundus, Sarah Forfar, Dan Kay, Matt Bass, Darwin Hand, and pa- Patrick Pecoraro. Ben Bignell, Jean Tellier, John Gridney, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney, Tiffany Boyd, John Bertram, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stephen Alberon, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zuknarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, RTM, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Slazuski, Jim Drapeau, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie, Gary S., Robert, Greg Briggs, Grendon Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luther, and Matt Sutter, Mark Hessenflo, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and EO. Thank you for your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience or just the Patreon link at our website. We are running a limited time special offer until October 14th. So act now on next week's show. Once again, we'll be broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live, where you can watch and join our chat room. But don't worry if you can't make it. You can always find past episodes at our YouTube channel or twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science anywhere good podcasts are found. Uh, If you did enjoy the show, remember to tell your friends about Twist. For more information on anything that you have heard here today, show notes are going to be available on our website, twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners, and where you can pre-order our 2020 Twist Blair's Animal Corner calendar. You can also contact us directly. Email Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, Kirsten at this week in science, uh, Kirsten at Kirsten at this week in science.com, or Blair at Blair Baz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist T W I S somewhere in the subject line. Otherwise, what will happen, Kiki? Oh, your email is going to get spam filtered into oblivion. That's what's going to happen. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at twist science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. And we'll be back here next week. We hope you'll join us once again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. (laughs) This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way So everybody listen To what I say I use the scientific method For all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion All over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma God the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 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 Science. This week in science This week in science This week in science 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 Science. Got a 
laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science This week in science this week in science, 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 this week in science.